In our sessions today, we've talked about the one single factor that will drive us as part of the ecclesia to consider the welfare of our brethren and sisters. And remember, that was love. No, no other force could do what we've seen done by our brethren and sisters in years gone by. Those faithful that we looked at, that were listed for us here in the scriptures, it, it would just be impossible. And the verse we went to, remember, was Ephesians 5, verse 25. As Christ gave himself for the ecclesia, as he showed that love, that's the principle. And here tonight, you look at verse 9, this little phrase, let love be without dissimulation. And that comes right in the context of all the different members of the ecclesia and all the things, the responsibilities they had to do on God's behalf. Let that love be a deep love, an abiding love, not a shallow love, is really what it means in the Greek. And so that's what we're talking about this evening. If we've got that driving force, what will it lead us to do in ecclesial life? Where can we all fit in? If we've got that driving force, that depth of love for our brethren and sisters, what will we be able to do on behalf of others? Now, we call that service, service in the truth. Now, Brother Tanner put it this way. Godly service is the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.25, we could slot in there. This applies as much to each aspect of ecclesial life as it does to the manner of our personal devotion. He who was the Lord and Master was at the same time the chief servant of our God. It will not do to be slipshod in our ecclesial life. We should render diligent and acceptable service to the best of our ability, even though these may be limited. It means our work shall be carried out with an awareness that it is for the Lord. There's a couple of things that Brother Tennant makes in there that I think, amongst all the other powerful points... <clears throat> that are extremely relevant to us. We should be diligent. Not slack concerning the things of God. And we do what we do to the best of our ability. And that doesn't matter what it is. When we make a commitment, which is a, ter a term we've spoken about to date in our studies, when we make that commitment to serve, then we are diligent with that and we do the best possible job we can do with that. And Brother uh, Tennant finishes it off and says, and the reason for that is we're doing it for the Lord in that you do it for the least of these, my brethren, you do it unto me. So where do we fit? Well, it doesn't matter really in that sense. What matters is that when we accept responsibility... We are diligent with that and we make sure that on behalf of our Lord, in our service of others, we do the best possible thing we can. You know, Matthew 25, there's the parable of the talents. Let's just go back there. Because often in ecclesial life, we say, uh, well, I don't have that talent. I don't have... That, that's, that's, it's not my ability well, have you ever noticed that in ecclesial life, a number of brethren and sisters end up doing things in service that are not their natural talent? Now, Brother Ray's sitting back there, and he's an accountant, and I know he happens to be, because I looked up in your book, he's your finance brother here. And usually it pays to have an accountant as a finance brother. Usually. Usually. But there are lots and lots of things that individuals can do in ecclesial life. And we look at them and we say, well, that brother or that sister, it isn't natural. What they're doing is something to the best of their ability and they're doing it diligently because that's the opportunity that's been given them. Now, when we read in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, it's important that as we start off this evening that we we emphasise the fact that it's 
not so much to do with our natural talent. Because the Lord, in verse 14, was going off into a far country and he called his servants and he delivered unto them his goods. Now, of course, we know in the parable there's a, an overlay that the Lord was, uh, you know, in, about to die. He was going into a far country and he did deliver his goods. That is, he left with the apostles uh, the power of the Holy Spirit which we read of in the early chapters of the book of Acts. We, we know there's an application to that. But let's just think about this in its application to us. So the Lord has gone and he's delivered unto his servants his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one. So what goods has he left us? Well, we've been left with a complete scripture. We've been left with a record of his life. We've been left, brethren and sisters, with responsibilities. We're part of his body. And to some of us, he's left five talents, to others two, and to others one. They're the responsibilities that he's given us inside his body. And he gave to every man. That's an important point. There isn't anybody within the ecclesia that hasn't been left with some responsibility by the Lord Jesus Christ to perform during our life in the truth. So every man, according to his several ability. So we've been left with responsibilities according to what we can do. And there is not one of us that is exempt. Every one of us has been left responsibility. And straightway he took his journey. So the Lord, having delivered that, immediately left. And those apostles were left. And they floundered for a while, didn't they? And they had to work out, where did they fit? And it took them some time. And we get into the early chapters of the book of Acts. It's not till Acts chapter 3 that Peter can stand up and speak on behalf of the apostles. And so what do we understand, brethren and sisters? That... We, you and I, have been left with this responsibility while our Lord has, has departed. And all of us have got abilities. And all of us are given responsibilities. And we've got to use those things, our abilities, as best we can in the service of the truth. But an opportunity arises. And when that opportunity arises for service... We have to accept that responsibility and we have to do it to the best of our ability and we've got to be diligent in it. Now that's the principle, I think, that comes out of that little parable. So with that as our base, I'd like to look at an example. And it's the example of Moses. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 2. So here's a brother... You know the circumstances of his life. He was brought up in Pharaoh's house. He knew because of the education that had been given by his mother that he was a goodly child. He was a special child. He'd been born with a responsibility. And there came a time when this man decided this was the moment for him. And in verse 11, it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. So he, he grew to manhood. And he decided then was the time to go out and see what was happening with his brethren. And when he went out there, he, in a way, brethren and sisters, he was conscience smitten, wasn't he? Because he looked at them, he understood uh, how he was living, and he looked now how his brethren were, were living, and he killed that Egyptian in verse 12. And he determined that this was the moment and he determined what way his people were going to be saved. See, he did it in his own power. He determined that. There was no consultation with God. Now, when we go over to chapter 3, verse 9, the things are a little different now, aren't they? Moses has fled. He's been living out in the wilderness. 
And in verse 9, God says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come up unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Now, that, Moses saw that back in chapter 2. That's why he acted. This, that was no news to Moses, was it? 40 years ago, he could have said to God, look, I knew that 40 years ago. Why couldn't I? Why didn't you just let me go then? The whole process, I could have, I could have got underway and maybe I could have done everything Israel needed. They wouldn't have had to go through another 40 years. But God determined this was the moment of time. And so he called upon his servant, Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So he's been called to service. Now's the moment, Moses. I'm calling you to go and save your people. What does Moses say? Well, verse 11. Now, there are five responses you'll see that I've listed up there. If you haven't highlighted these in your Bible, I think you really should, particularly if you've got children, and this is something you could do as a Bible-marking exercise when you're doing your daily readings. Chapter 3, verse 11. It's time, Moses, I'm calling you to service. What does Moses say? Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? So Moses responds. He says, Well, why me? I'm comfortable here. I've tried it once, it didn't work. I wanted to work in the ecclesia and achieve things, but things didn't work out. So why would I try now? Have we ever felt that way in ecclesial life? You know, we've suffered some disappointments. And we're asked to accept responsibility and we say, well, oh, well, it didn't work out last time, so no, I'm not prepared to do it. And Moses said, why me? Now, God gives a response, verse 12. And he said, I will be with thee. You see, it's not you, Moses, it's me. See what God said to him? Moses says, me? I can't do that. I've tried that and it didn't work. And God says, Moses... You tried to do it in your own strength. It's not about you, Moses. It's all about me. So I've highlighted who am I in blue, and certainly I will be with thee in yellow, because there's our first response. Me? No, Moses. It's me that's important in this exercise. The second comes in verse 13. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Well, hold on, God. I don't even know who you are. The Egyptians have got names for all their gods. I don't know your name. I can't go back there and represent you because I don't know you. And God said to him in verse 14, here's the answer. What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Here's the answer. I am that I am. And God said to Moses, I will be, I have a future in my people. And he said, thus shalt thou say, that shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I will be hath sent me. I will be. Highlight. There's your answer, Moses. Who are you? I'm the God, the living God, who has a living purpose with my people. That's who I am. Chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me. That's what I've highlighted in blue. They will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, 
Yahweh hath not appeared unto thee. Well, hold on, says Moses. No one's going to believe me that I've been stuck out in the wilderness for 40 years. And all of a sudden, this God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of the fathers has appeared unto me. They won't believe me. And God said, all right, in verse 8, it shall come to pass if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. They will believe the sign. So Moses, I'm going to give a sign. And we know, of course, he uh, you know, turned his uh, rod into a, a serpent and he put his hand in and it became leprous, put it in and, and it came back whole again. So Moses was saying, no, look, it won't work because these people, they're not going to believe me. Moses, it's not about believing you. You put your hand in and pull it out. Moses, has that got anything to do with you? Put it in and it's whole again. That's not human, brethren and sisters. That's a miracle. They'll believe you. Because they've never, ever seen that done before. This is a God that can do the impossible. This is a God that can create the world. This is a God that can cause leprosy and can heal it. There's your answer, Moses. Verse 10, Moses says unto Yahweh, O my Lord, I am not eloquent. Highlight it. Neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Oh, my, oh God, I, I, I can't do that. I can't speak. I'm, I'm hopeless. I stumble over my words. I stutter. I've been out here for 40 years. I might have been in, in Pharaoh's court, but I'm, I'm no good at anything like that now. I'm no diplomat. God says, verse 11, Who hath made man's mouth? Verse 12, I will be thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. God says, Moses, you haven't got the point yet. It's not about you. Who made the mouth, Moses? Who has the ability to cause you to be able to speak? I'll be your mouth. You will be eloquent. You, you, you will t I'll teach you what you can say to these people. And for the last time, Moses raises another objection in verse 13. And he said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And finally, we get to the point. Send someone else. We ever had that reaction in a collegial life? Find someone else to do it. I can't do it. Go and find someone else. And that's what Moses said to Yahweh. Go and find someone else. And God said to him in verse 14, and the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Moses. Let's just stop there. Why was God angry? Why did he get angry with Moses? Was Moses eloquent? Well, he probably wasn't. Was there truth in some of the things that, that Moses said? There probably was. But God was offering him the opportunity to save his people out of a dire set of circumstances and God was saying to him, Moses, I'm going to be with you. It'll be done in my power. And ultimately, Moses said, I don't want to do it. Send someone else. And God was angry. So, brethren and sisters, when we find ourselves in ecclesial life, and someone says, well, Brother Jeff, would you please do this on behalf of the Ecclesia? Without valid reason, it really is our responsibility 
to find a way, isn't it? I say without valid reason, because there are valid reasons. You may also be doing something else at that time and so you can't be in two places, etc., etc. But that's why God was angry. This man, in the, in the, ultimately, had said to God, I won't do what you ask me to do. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? And he, I've highlighted that. I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Moses, I'm going to cut all the excuses here. Your brother Aaron's on his way to talk to you. I've called him. And he's going to be glad to see you. And he will speak on your behalf. It's interesting, isn't it? Because right at the beginning... We read about Aaron's input. But by the time we get to the end, when they're leaving Egypt, who's doing all the talking? Moses. So he shouldered that responsibility. But here we are, five occasions. And five responses from God. To teach us that in ecclesial life, there are times when... We don't have a choice. We have to accept responsibility. It's a work of God within the ecclesia. So from that point, brethren and sisters, once that commitment was made, once Moses was determined on a path to which he'd been called, remember those words in Acts chapter 7, the words of Stephen. He was never, ever, ever again separated from his people. Did he understand that principle? Oh, he learnt that principle, didn't he? And from that day forward... He made an utter commitment to serve the people of God. And that's what we're called upon to make in our own lives. A total commitment. Let's just go back to a passage we've looked at once before, and that's in 1 Corinthians and at chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11. And in Romans 12, we, we, as we did our reading tonight, you would have noticed about how uh, the, uh, the different roles within the ecclesia were mentioned. And, and you've got exactly the same um, in verses 9 and verse 10. And in verse 11, this is what we read. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So what are, we, what are we reading about? Well, in ecclesial life, brethren and sisters, there's, there's a range of opportunities to serve. And here we are in the Corinthian ecclesia and in all the ecclesias in the first century with the Holy Spirit gifts, the, the division of those gifts was the work of God. So you, you couldn't say, well, there's Brother X or Sister Y or whatever it is, and we don't think that they're doing the right thing uh, by either preaching or whatever it might be that they had a responsibility to do within the ecclesia. Because Paul makes it clear, all these worketh that one and the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So that responsibility was... Chosen by God. And when we come over to verse 18, now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. So within that ecclesia, there was absolute clarity. And that was one of the things that really upset the Apostle Paul. Because a large number of the members wanted one gift. But, as far as the ecclesia was concerned, God had decided. God had determined that the ecclesia was one. And what member would receive what responsibility within the ecclesia. So, it wasn't to do with natural talent. It wasn't to do with what cue you stood on or anything of that nature. It was to do with the determination as to what would best serve the interests of the ecclesia. 
So you see, brethren and sisters, the principle is no different in ecclesial life today. We can't determine, as individuals, what we are going to do. That's the decision the ecclesia makes. There may be things we'd like to do, and it may be in the end that the ecclesia decides they're the things we can do. But it may very well be we end up doing things we don't want to do. There are two things, I speak here from a personal viewpoint, there are two things I would love to do in my ecclesia. And I never get to do either of them. And it's not because I don't want to, it's I, I do want to. But I'm, I'm, I'm never asked to. I'm never elected to. But I'd love to do them. I'd love to Bible read. I, I love doing reading of the Bible. And I love being a doorman. And if ever I see, if I ever walk in the door and a doorman's late, I jump on the door. And the reason I love it is because it gives me the opportunity to talk to brethren and sisters because I don't get a chance to see everyone. But I don't get asked to do those two things. I'd love to. You may have things in your ecclesia you'd love to do that you never get asked to do. But if you see an opportunity, there's a chance to get in there and, 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 and give it a go. But in ecclesial life, it turned, turns out that there are things that perhaps we want to do that we never, ever get asked to do. Be very careful that we don't end up criticising someone who's taking that responsibility because we want it. Be very careful. Because that happens in ecclesial life. I look at it and I say, well, I'd like, I desire that role. So what do I do? I focus on the brother or sister, whoever it is that's got that role, and I criticise them. I undermine them. And I can do that very easily. And it's because I want that. But maybe that's not the choice of the ecclesia. Maybe that's not the best thing for the ecclesia. The ecclesia generally doesn't make mistakes. You know, I have a healthy respect for the result of an ecclesial ballot. And when we get our ecclesial ballot paper, we're asked to read Timothy and Titus and to mark our paper and select, in, in the a case of our ballot paper, the brethren we think are best suited as serving brethren. And ecclesias generally get it right. It's rare that they get it wrong. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. I think last year, in your uh, special effort, you would have gone to Romans chapter 12, the first couple of verses, when you were talking about the mind of Christ. I'm pretty certain you would have, at some point, gone to these verses with Brother Nathan. And we're talking about the renewing of our mind. We, we are talking about a total change in the way we think. Have you ever noticed that having been transformed in our mind, having, having changed our mode of thinking from the thinking that is, is common to our nature to the thinking that is in the mind of Christ, what the Apostle Paul says the result will be? Look at verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's remarkable, isn't it? What's the first change that Paul lists off for us when we think like Christ rather than think like man? We think less of ourselves than what we did before. Not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's how we think. There's no grounds for self-glory. God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. 
So the first thing that happens to us when our mind is transformed is that we think less of ourselves and guess who we think more of? Verse 3, uh, verse 4, sorry. For as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, and so on. So who do we start to think about? We start to think about others. And we look around the ecclesia and we say, oh, wow, look at that brother over there. He, he's terrific. Look what he's doing. Look at that sister over there. What a wonderful job. Because they've all been given the opportunity to serve. We're not criticising them. We're appreciating the fact that we're all part of the one body and God hath dealt a measure to all of us. Not because I'm anything, not because the other brother or sister are anything, but for the well-being and the operation of that ecclesia. And Paul says, when your mind changes, you think less about yourself and you elevate your brethren and sisters in this sense that they are fulfilling a role to which they have been called in service within the ecclesia of God. So he, in verse 8, that is called to exhort, or he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Because the, the force behind that, as we started, is in verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. And that happens because our mind is transformed. We're thinking differently. And you know, Paul says from verse 9 through to verse uh, 13, there are some things we can all do within the ecclesia. Don't matter who we are. Everybody can do these things. We can all abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. We can all be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. We can all in honour prefer one another. We can all, and it says here, not slothful in business, it means not lacking in zeal. We can all be zealous, we can be fervent in spirit, and we can all serve the Lord. We can all rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and continue instant in prayer. We can all distribute to the necessity of saints. We can all be given to hospitality. So what's the first result? We think less of ourselves. What's the next result? We honour the work of our brethren and sisters. And every one of us does all of those things. So it's remarkable what can happen when we change the way we think. And in verse 15, we can rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. We will have an empathy with our brethren and sisters because they are part of the body of which we are a member. And so there will be a feeling between us. And in verse 16, there will be a harmony. We will be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. So Paul's now going to summarise, with a change in the way we think, Attitude toward ourselves, attitude toward our brethren and sisters, and the operation of the ecclesia. In verse 16, he says this, the diaglot. Be ye of the, of the same disposition toward each other. Regard not high things, but conform yourselves to the lowly. Do not become wise in your own estimation. Now, I'm not promoting the New Living Translation, but in this case, it gives us the general sense of what this verse means. Puts it in a language we can all understand. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. That, that last little phrase, is probably one of the biggest issues in ecclesial life. And we would call that pride, wouldn't we? So here we are, says Paul. You've changed the way you think and it's all about your relationship with your brethren and sisters. And at the end of the day, it means 
that we will live in harmony with each other and we won't be know-alls. We will be kind and considerate to our brethren and sisters. And Paul says, every one of us can do that. Where do we fit in ecclesial life? There it is. Every single brother and sister can meet the criteria that Paul has outlined here in Romans 12 from verse 9 onwards. None of us find those things absolutely impossible to do. We find them hard to do, but it's possible for us to do those things within the ecclesia. Now, come to Acts chapter 6. So in Acts 6, we have the first issue in ecclesial life that occurs. We've got a problem. How is it going to be dealt with? And the issue revolves in verse 1 around a murmuring that has arisen of the Grecians against the Hebrews. So we've got a number in the ecclesia, they're widows, who feel neglected that the welfare, their welfare within the ecclesia is, is not being considered. And they're called Grecians, that is, they're not individuals who live by the law. <coughs> then we've got another group who are called Hebrews because they're probably, well, will be Jewish families and more than likely live under the Mosaic Code. There's nothing wrong with that. But what was clearly happening here in the city of Jerusalem was that there was some tension that had arisen and one group of widows with the same needs as the other group of widows were being neglected. Now their needs weren't met by Centrelink. There were dire needs here that had to be met by their brethren and sisters. And clearly that wasn't what was occurring. So here we've got a problem that is just typical of all the problems that arise in ecclesial life. We've got one group here and another group here and this group feels that they're being, they're being marginalised within the ecclesia. Have we ever heard that in ecclesial life? We've got one group feel that they're, they're a bit downtrodden, they're marginalised. So that's our issue. The apostles are called in and they display an enormous amount of wisdom, don't they? And they say, in verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So the apostles say... Look, we think that the best solution here is for the ecclesia to conduct a meeting. And in that meeting, to appoint or to elect, to recommend seven brethren. Now, these seven brethren have to have certain characteristics. And what they did is that they made that recommendation to the apostles, and the apostles, at the end of verse uh, 3, made the determination that they should be appointed, that those seven brethren would be appointed to ensure that the welfare of all the widows in the ecclesia were being met. Now, uh, let's just first of all have a look at verses 2 and 3 from the Jerusalem Bible. So the twelve called a full meeting of the disciples and addressed them. So we'd say an ecclesial meeting, a business meeting. It would not be right for us to neglect the word of God so as to give out food. Now, let's just stop there. Uh, that almost sounds terrible, doesn't it? But what the apostles were trying to say was that their responsibilities, that they were given. Remember, Matthew 25, I'm going away into a far country and I'm leaving you with certain responsibilities. And their responsibilities were they were given the Holy Spirit and it was their role to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to develop ecclesias. So they said, it's not right for us to neglect 
what we have been by God given as a responsibility to be held responsible for welfare. You, brothers, must select among yourselves seven men of good reputation, filled with the Spirit and with wisdom, and we will hand over this duty to them and we'll continue to devote ourselves to prayer and to the service of the Word. So the outcome was going to be that the ecclesia was going to be blessed in two ways. First of all, that the apostles were going to continue to study the Word of God and to feed the Ecclesia's spiritual needs. And secondly, there were a group of brethren, faithful brethren, who were going to also feed the physical needs and care for the physical needs of a group of members of the Ecclesia. So the Ecclesia was going to benefit on each of those counts. So the apostles were not going to be distracted but seven very faithful brethren were going to be elected to assist the ecclesia in this particular role. Now, why, why did the apostles come up with that as a recommendation? Where did they learn that this had happened in time past? Well, come with me to Exodus chapter 32. Sorry, I meant Exodus 18. I had something on my mind there. Exodus 18. I'm looking up Exodus 18 and saying Exodus 32 to you, so I apologise. Exodus 18. And Moses has been down into Egypt and he's come back with the children of Israel. And in verse 1, he meets Jethro. And when Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and all that Yahweh had brought Israel out of Egypt, and so on, Jethro, uh, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, and so on. So Moses comes back from Egypt, and he's working his way up to the Promised Land with the children of Israel. And he comes and he meets uh, his father-in-law, Jethro. Note he's called the priest of Midian. Uh, I suspect there was an, a little ecclesia there somewhere that this man was working with. Because when Moses came in contact with him, this man understood the things of the truth. He had a grasp of the principles of the scripture. And we know that because now what happens is that Jethro observes Moses. And Jethro, in verse 5, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness where he encamped at the Mount of God. And he sits and watches Moses for the day. And what happens? Well, all these people come to Moses for judgment. Verse 13, it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning to evening? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. They've got, they've got a matter. And Moses' father-in-law, in verse 17, said, The thing that thou doest is not good. It'll kill you, Moses. You can't do it. You can't keep this up. This is what you ought to do. Because he says in verse 18, Thou wilt surely, surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Hearken thou under my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And he said, what you should be doing is appointing other people to judge uh, what we would say were legal matters, to make determinations. But Moses, you should preserve yourself to represent these people to God. Otherwise, you're going to kill yourself. You can't keep this up. So in verse 21, he talked about appointing rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens and let them judge the people at all the seasons. And I think the apostles looked at that, considered that and said, ah, oh, 
Now, there's a principle. Moses was given the responsibility of those people. But what he did, he passed some of that responsibility over for the daily affairs of the ecclesia to other brethren. And he retained the responsibility of the relationship of that ecclesia with God. And that was at Jethro's recommendation. So when we get into Acts chapter 6, we have virtually the same set of circumstances. It was impossible for the apostles to fulfil both roles. The care of the, the Grecian widows and, and to look at the welfare of the ecclesia and at the same time fulfil the responsibility that God had left them with of establishing the ecclesia and preaching the gospel. So the ecclesia took that on board. And in verse 5, the saying pleased, the, of, of Acts uh, 6, the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And as we said in, a, in one of our previous studies, I mean, we don't get that definition about the other six brethren, do we? So this Stephen is a standout. That's what the scripture is telling us. And Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas and each one of those names has a Greek background, doesn't it? So the Ecclesia, at their business meeting, thought about what the apostles had said and they considered that some of these sisters may very well have been from a Greek background and some of them were sisters who, who, who were not given to keeping the, keeping the law. And in their families, that wasn't their way of life. So who do they choose? They choose the group of brethren. Yes, they're all faithful. Yes, they've all got good report. But they're a group of brethren who meet their cultural background and completely understand the circumstances of their life. It's a great lesson in ecclesial life, isn't it? The ecclesia made that determination. They showed wisdom. The apostles showed wisdom. They made a recommendation. The ecclesia considered that and they showed wisdom. And the apostles in verse 6, when they set before, whom they set before the apostles and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them and they put their blessing on those seven brethren to perform that role within the ecclesia. And it was acknowledged by that, that this was God's work and that those seven brethren as faithful and as well-meaning as they were, needed God's blessing before that work could be successful. And the apostles gave it that blessing in verse 6. And so in ecclesial life, whatever our responsibility, whatever we're called to do, without God's blessing, you'll come to nothing. That's what we're learning. Faithful as these men were, without God's blessing from the apostles, that work would not have been successful. So the apostles showed wisdom, the ecclesia showed wisdom, and God blessed the work. And brethren and sisters, the ecclesia thrived. That's a great lesson for us, isn't it? So then, come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Is it wrong for us to want to serve? The answer is no. It's right for us to want to serve. But in 1 Timothy 3, the apostle addresses a particular question with Timothy. And Timothy's been left to establish this ecclesia. And when we say establish it, he's got to establish it from the ground up. So one of the things that has to be put in place is a group of elders called here bishops. And in verse 1, this is what he says. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now we, we might look at that and think, well, that, you know, if, if we thought there was someone who desired some office, um, you know, perhaps we might think poorly about that. And Paul says, no, they're desiring a good work. But, says Paul, 
Just let that brother think for a while about what it means to be a bishop. So from verses 2 to 7, Paul says this. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behaviour, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his own children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the ecclesia of God? Not a novice, lest being lift up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, brethren and sisters, how many brethren fit that description? I never met one. Nobody fits that description in its entirety. So when we mark our ballot paper, if, if we were in Ephesus, we would be choosing the brother or brethren who best fit that. So a brother comes up to Timothy and he says, I, I, I'm, I'd like to be a bishop. And Timothy says, righto, brother. Now, these are the qualities that are required. Just go away and have a think about that. And I think that's what Paul's saying to Timothy. It's good, it's right, it's proper to want to serve your brethren and sisters. But always consider what it means in service. What sort of qualities do we have to have if we're going to serve? So it's one thing to say, that's what I want to do. It's another thing to meet the criteria. And sometimes the two are far apart. And that applies to all sorts of responsibilities within the ecclesia. This one here is just that we've got the definition in front of us. So, brethren and sisters, whatever it is that we're going to do in ecclesial life, we've got to remember the personal responsibility that comes along with that role. And I think that's the lesson that Paul was trying to uh, encourage Timothy so that when he talked to brethren and sisters within that ecclesia, he, he could inculcate into them an understanding of how we have to develop, have to develop our own character that we might become servants to our brethren and sisters. The responsibility starts with us and how in Romans 12 that thinking changes so that we think less of ourselves and are determined to serve our brethren and sisters. So, what are some principles? First of all, we should be always ready to serve. Paul says, Galatians 5.13, by love serve one another. And there's that little word again, love. We should do everything as best we can. Now, I want to look at that passage, 2 uh, Corinthians. It's about Titus, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We should be doing everything as best we can. You know, Paul sent Titus to Corinth. And Paul wrote them a letter. And this is what he says in verse 22. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes, who's oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the ecclesias and the glory of Christ. So what do we know? Paul says, this brother has been proven diligent in whatever he's done in his ecclesial life. Whatever role he's been asked to perform, he's been diligent. You know, that's a wonderful reference to have, isn't it, from the Apostle Paul. And the third point we've got there, 
We've got to work for the welfare of our members. Just come back a little bit further in, in this chapter, in chapter 8. We read in verse 16. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. Now here's a brother, and, and the Apostle Paul's telling us that this brother was... was he, he, his mind was taken up in the care of his brethren and sisters. He had an earnest care for them. And in verse 17, he was more forward of his own accord. Paul couldn't hold him back. He was just busting to get over there and help the Corinthians. That's the spirit we need in ecclesial life. So not only was Titus diligent in any role that the Apostle Paul had asked him to perform, but his concern was for his brethren and sisters. And, and all Paul had to say was, there's a problem at Corinth, and he was gone. And all the brethren and sisters at Corinth should come to understand that this brother, that's the spirit we have to engender into our ecclesia. And that, brethren and sisters, is the spirit we have to engender into our ecclesias. We should accept guidance. Uh, remember Exodus 32 that we looked at uh, previously where Moses was told about going back and seeking the wisdom of the fathers. So if there is something that we, we, we want to do in the ecclesia and, and we, we, we really genuinely want to serve our brethren and sisters, go and talk to some senior brethren and sisters, depending on whether you're a brother or a sister, and talk to them about it. And just ask them, you know, do you think I'm suitable? Or, or will, will there be an opportunity? How do, if you don't know how to go about doing it, ask them. Seek advice. Most of all, work within the decisions of the ecclesia. Don't try and shortcut the ecclesia. It doesn't work. Remember Acts 6. All the ecclesia got together. All the ecclesia responded. All the ecclesia made a recommendation to the apostles and that was blessed by God. Don't work outside the confines of the ecclesia and the decisions your ecclesia has made. We are all brethren and we're called to serve the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in uh, Luke chapter 22. Brother Roberts in the Ecclesial Guide put it this way. The appointment of brethren to certain offices is not the appointment of men to exercise authority, but of men to serve. There must be no authority, only service. The ecclesia does not appoint masters, but servants. All are brethren. It is important to keep this feature constantly in the front. Christ places it there. One is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. So you see, it, there's no ranking in this, is there? It's not an appointment to some sort of managerial position or whatever to serve in the ecclesia. The, to serve in the ecclesia means, brethren and sisters, exactly that. We are given to serve. And we will give of ourselves to serve our brethren and sisters because we are motivated by love. So some simple guidelines. Make it a matter of prayer. You want to work in the ecclesia? Pray for an opportunity. Pray for an opening. Volunteer for the simple tasks. Show the willing spirit that's required. It's often the simple tasks that we can't find brethren and sisters to perform. Be a volunteer. Always seek the welfare of ecclesias. What do we mean? Look for needs. Don't wait to be appointed. If there's a need, go and fill it. Seek that opportunity. Encourage others. Don't criticise. And if possible, accept responsibility. Because that's what we're called for in Christ. If it's possible. When you're asked to accept responsibility perform. 
you know, I don't know who it was, but I remember hearing someone once say that, you know, when we get to the judgment seat, it won't be about the big things. It'll be much more about the little things that we've done. And our service is for our brethren and sisters. In turn, brethren and sisters, that's for our Lord. And in turn, it's for our God. So however small we may consider that task, in God's eyes, in our Lord's eyes, it's important. And you know, in the eyes of someone, our brother or our sister, that we perform that service on behalf of, it's important for them as well. However little that might be, that task, it could be critical in the life of your brother or your sister. So where do we fit in ecclesial life? Well, we all fit in as part of that body. And if, I think if we can follow those simple principles that we've t talked about tonight, our ecclesias will be far, far better places in which we can operate. There will be a spirit about them. Remember those things about Moses. And eventually he got to the point where it's not about us. Our service is all about God.